Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. We're going to continue in our study in Revelation. Today, we're going to talk about the church in Pergamum. To the angel, I'm, I'm reading from chapter 2, verse 12. Um, 2, verse through, I should say, verse 17. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, He who has the sharp two-edged sword says these things. I know your works and where you live, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold firmly to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have there those who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. So you also have those who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes... I will give the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except he who receives it. So we are going to now go to my notes. I recommend, I have nice notebooks that I can uh, transfer out. I like to keep important notes, things that I like to refer to through the years. So to Pergamos or Pergamum, it means high tower or thoroughly married. This letter presents the Lord as the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. This is the word of God. We know that from Hebrews 4.12, with which he will judge evildoers in the assembly. We go back to that in verse 16. Pergamos was the Asian headquarters for the cult of emperor worship, hence it is called the place of Satan's throne. In spite of the surrounding paganism, the church had remained loyal to Christ, even though one of its members, Antipas, had been martyred for his confession of the Lord Jesus. He was the first known Asian to die for refusing to worship the emperor. <coughs> but the Lord must reprove the church for permitting men with evil doctrines to continue in the Christian fellowship. So there were those who held the doctrine of Balaam and of the Nicolaitans. The doctrine of Balaam actually sanctioned eating things sacrificed to idols and sexual immorality. So they endorsed it. They sanctioned it. And then we know from previous studies, I'm not going to go over the different views on Nicolaitans. We've already covered that um, in our study in Revelation. I agree with uh, more than a few. I think the majority of theologians that the Nicolaitans, the, the practice of that was the rise of the clerical system. Um, in fact, Schofield, Dr. C.I. Schofield, links the doctrine with the rise of the clerical system, and this is what he says. It is the doctrine that God has instituted an order of clergy or priest as distinguished from the laity. The word is formed from two Greek words, Nico, conqueror or overcomer, and Leos, the people. The New Testament knows nothing of a clergyman, still less of a priest, except as all sons of God in this dispensation are a royal priesthood. In the apostolic church, there were officers, elders or bishops, and deacons and gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We know that from Ephesians 4.11. These might or may not be elders or deacons, but late in the apostolic period, there emerged a, disp a disposition to arrogate to elders alone authority to administer ordinances and generally 
to constitute themselves a class between God and the people. They were the Nicolaitans. You will observe that what were deeds in the Ephesus or late apostolic period had become a doctrine 200 years later in the Pergamos or Constantine period. So um, I, I agree with the theologians who believe it's the rise of that clerical system. You, there is no go-between between you, a believer, the nanosecond you believed on the Son of God. You admitted you are a sinner in need of a Savior and believed on the Son of God. You are saved, sealed, and sanctified until the day of redemption. So there's no need for that go-between. You are the nanosecond you believe. It's an event. You're born again and dwelt with Holy Spirit. You become a child of God, an heir of God, a co-heir with Christ Jesus. You are seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus, and you are a holy person and a royal priesthood. Praise God. So as a believer, now it's an event that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, solo fide. If you don't know what I'm talking about, the ABCs of salvation is in the description box, as well as a link to the video, faith plus nothing equals salvation and eternal security. After we are believers, we do experience godly sorrow. And as he's talking to the church, these believers, this church that is endorsing and tolerating these things should repent of that. They should have godly sorrow and turn from that. This is not the individual. Although as an individual, if I know I've sinned, I confess it to the Lord. I'm already saved. Doesn't save me. It's not a requirement to stay saved. But I want to do that. I want to honor God with my life. So, um, if not, the Lord said he himself would fight against these evil men. So the saints should hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The overcomer would be given hidden manna and a white stone. Now, I want to stop there. Who is the overcomer? Well, the Bible defines it, and it's all throughout the word. 1 John 5.5, 5, who is, this is what the word says, who is the, who is it that overcomes the world? This is the word of God. I'm reading it right from the word. This is the NIV. I don't usually refer to that one, but I am right now. That's what came up first. You can look in the translation you like. Who is, 1 John 5.5, 5, who is it that overcomes the world? Only, this is important, who is it that overcomes the world? Only, that, that means this is the only way. Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Boom, there you have it. And so, now I want to go into the overcomer in Pergamum. We know what the overcomer is. But what are the hidden manna and the white stone? That's a good question, right? Manna is a type of Christ himself. It may speak of heavenly food in contrast to foods offered to idols. That's verse 14. Hidden manna may be some sweet secret communion with himself known in the glory as the one who suffered here. So it's Jesus it's Jesus. Hallelujah. And the nanosecond we believe. How do we partake? The nanosecond we believe. When we take communion, right? It's an ordinance of the church. It's not required for salvation. It's, it's, he said, he took the bread and broke it and said, take eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then in like manner, he took the cup when it was poured out and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. The new covenant is a better covenant made between father and son. We can't even break it when we have believed. We are then in Christ. We are seated in Christ, in the heavenlies. And that's how God sees you. We get all the benefits of it. Hallelujah. We are children of God, heirs of God, and co-heirs with Christ Jesus. That is just, that is glorious. So the white stone has been explained in many ways. It was a token of acquittal. In a legal case. Hallelujah. Jesus shed his precious blood. And paid the debt for our sin. Once and for all. Past, present, and future. All sufficient. So the white stone was 
a token of acquittal in a legal case. It was a symbol of victory in an athletic contest. It was an expression of welcome given by a host to his guest. It seems clear that it is a reward given by the Lord to the overcomer. Who's the overcomer? First John 5, 5. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only, that's important, only, there's no other way, only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And people try to twist it. We are saved over 200 verses by faith alone. Solo fide. Faith plus nothing equals salvation and eternal security. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, brothers and sisters, I, I've been breaking the churches down individually so you have a reference to go back to. So that, that covers Pergamos or Pergamon. I hope you are blessed by that brief study on the Church of Pergamon. I'll be back on hopefully later today. I'm, I'm going to be doing a joint call with Brother Greg Jackson, and then I will be reading the Word of God with you. God bless you guys. Shalom, shalom, and have an awesome rest of your day.